Okay, so in this video we'll talk about a way of approximating functions which is very useful, especially in physics, in fact you've probably used it already in physics, without knowing about its mathematical definition. So let's first step back and uh, recall what the definition of the tangent line is. So if we have a function f of x, the equation of the tangent line of f of x at a point x equals to a is given by y equals f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a. So f prime of a here is the slope of the tangent line. So in my little graph, for example, here the function is x squared, and the tangent line at x equals to 1 will be given by the equation y is equal to 1 plus 2 times x minus 1. Okay, so we know that very well by now. Now, the idea of linear approximations is very simple. It's just the idea that if you look at the function very close to the point x equals to a, so if you zoom in and look very, very close, then as you can see here, the tangent lines become tangent line becomes very, very similar to the function itself. So in other words, we can approximate the function near this point as being given by the tangent line. Of course, they're not the same, but the tangent line provides a good first approximation of the function. And the, 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 the main point here is that the function could be extremely complicated, and the tangent line is always a line. So the tangent line is always a very simple equation, so it makes sense to try to use it to approximate a function, because pretty often it's a lot easier to deal with than the function itself. So we, we call that a linear approximation, so more precisely, we say that the linear approximation of a function f of x at x equals to a is the idea of replacing the function by the equation of its tangent line at x equals to a. And the function on the right hand side here which gives the tangent line we call the linearization of our function f of x. Alright, so that's a pretty simple idea, but it turns out to be very useful and if you have ever studied the pendulum in physics then you've already used that without knowing about it, I guess. So let's look at the pendulum. So a pendulum is basically a massless rod. An ideal pendulum would be a massless rod with a mass here attached, and then we let the mass oscillates here around the vertical direction. Okay, so you could do a force diagram as you always do in physics. In this case, there's two forces. There's the gravity forces, which is pointing downwards, and there's the tension forces, which is pointing along the rod. Now you could split your gravity force into a part which is in the direction uh, perpendicular to the rod and the part which is in the same direction as the rod. It turns out that this part here will cancel the tension because there's no motion in this direction and all the motion will be in this direction perpendicular to the rod. And it's easy to calculate that the force in this direction, the magnitude of the force is mg sine theta and taking the signs into account the force in the direction perpendicular to the rod will be minus mg sine theta. Here mass uh, m is the mass of the pendulum and g is the gravitational acceleration. All right, and then you can use <coughs> sorry, you can use Newton's law, uh, f equals ma, to get the equation of motion, as you always do in physics. I will skip the steps, but you end up with this equation for the motion in terms of theta. So theta, your angle is changing in time, and its uh, change is governed by this equation of motion here. L is the length of the pendulum. And then when you reach this step, in pretty much every physics textbook, they tell you that you can replace sine theta by theta for small angles. Now, probably you were convinced that it makes sense because you just tried it for small angles. Take theta equals 0 0.01, and it is true that sine theta is very, very close to theta. But why is it uh, correct to do that mathematically? Why are we allowed to replace sine theta by theta mathematically? That's not so obvious. Well, ta-da-da! The answer is that Theta is the linear approximation of the function sine theta near theta equals to zero. So that's a direct application of the concept of linear approximations. So let me show why this is true. So we call that the linear approximation of a function is just the idea of replacing the function by its tangent line. So what we're claiming here is that the line y equals theta is the tangent line to the equation sine theta, the function sine theta at theta equals to zero, which is of course true. You can see from the graph of sine theta. But let's just calculate that directly. So here our function is sine theta. The derivative of our function of course is cos theta and here we're interested in the linear approximation near theta equals to zero. So we're going to write f theta as being approximately equal to f of zero. So this is sine of zero plus f prime of zero which is cos of zero times theta minus zero, but sine of zero is zero, cos of zero is one, so we end up with simply theta. So in other words, 
the linear approximation of the function sine theta near theta goes to zero is just theta. Again, you can see from the graph that this makes sense. Function sine theta will look like something like this. So at the point theta equals to zero, the tangent line here, my graph is not very good, but the tangent line here is just y equals theta. All right, so this was a neat, simple application of linear approximations. Now, instead of replacing a function by the equation of the tangent line, we could actually do better approximations and replace the equation of the function by higher degree polynomials. Now, these are called Taylor polynomials, and we'll study these will be the subject of probably not the next video, but the one after.